Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 172 for Monday, July 2nd, 2018. Folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the podcast by for and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing, Mr. Kent? I'm good, man. Happy Fourth of July week. Happy Fourth of July week for sure. Yeah. Summer's cooking by. Summer's happening. Yeah. It's hotter than blazes here. It seems like it's hotter than blazes That's everywhere. Right here. No, it's just really nice out here, but I hear That's the Northeast good. is crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you have any outdoor gigs coming up? Uh, I do. I'm trying to think. In August, we've got a couple outdoor gigs, but then I've got like some some deck gigs. So yeah, I mean the summer is often full of of outdoor gigs. I like outdoor They're gigs but as long I as do. it's warm out. I'd I'd much rather be sweltering on stage than cold on stage. Me too. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, you yeah, and I, uh, we've said this before. You and I, uh, we have different music that we like and, and we can certainly find differences. But but by and large, when it comes to performing live, you and I like the same thing. And and one of those things is we like to get on stage and sweat a little bit. It gets sweaty. Absolutely. You got to <laughs> dig in. <laughs> dig in. Feel it. Yeah. Yeah. We've had we've had a couple of cool ones. We played uh, last two weeks ago. We had a nice 8 to 10 p.m. outdoors at a big festival on a really nice stage. And it was a beautiful night. And, it, you know, those are perfect, right? Yep. So the sun's dipping down. The sun's still up at 8 o'clock, but, you know, by 8.30, it's pretty good. And, um, you know, and just a nice warm night with the lights on you. That feels the best to me. Not too many of the ones we do go that late. You know, mm. most of them are 6 to 8 or, you know, 4 to 6 or something like that. Yep. Yeah. A lot of the outdoor ones are 6 to 8, I guess. But um, yeah, those are those are the most fun. I mean, a- anytime. I'll tell you, we did have a really fun one in in a strange way last week. Uh, House Rockers played on the beach, so there's a a great restaurant right on the beach in Santa Cruz, California, called the Crow's Nest. And oh, I've been uh, they there. do yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've been there. That's I think that's the first time you saw me was there. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was quite a drive that you took. Thank you for that, by the way. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have to come from here. I just came down from uh, right. San Francisco yeah, yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not that big a drive. No. Um, but in the summers, they do a, a, a Thursday night concert series on the beach nice. and they get a couple thousand people and, you know, they do a barbecue and, you know, people come from all over. It's really fun environment. And there's not a stage though. They kind of put down a bunch of plywood, uh, and sand gets in your stuff all that over sucks. the place. I mean, it does. I mean, the pedal boards are, you know, you got to blow them out and, and, uh, but it's so fun. We, we have never turned it down and luckily we've done it about six or seven years. And, um, this one was a really, really good one. And I think it's one of those things where, you know, you put out a Facebook invite and all of a sudden you see excitement building and that kind of gives you like an early indication that people know that this is a good one. And then you start seeing people sharing it and people talking about it and you get the sense. And we, you know, it's, it's, um, it's about 25 minutes from here, you know, a half hour to 45 minutes away from the center of Silicon Valley. And we had a lot of people drive over the hill and then it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult drive traffic wise. It's a little two lane highway that goes over the mountains to the ocean. I remember you don't, you don't want to do that drive after having had anything to drink. Yeah. Uh, you, n- nothing. It, nothing. It's, it's yes. like tight lanes and not much room for error. Um, but, um, we had a great contingent of friends and neighbors from this side of the hill get excited to go over. The vibe was great. Perfect night, you know, blue sky, sun was out and, and the band played really, really well. And uh, there's a couple of videos of it that I, that I threw up and it just, you know, it was one of those ones where, you know, you can have the band play well and the vibe not be right. Or you can have the vibe be right and the band not play well. When it all lines up, when the stars all line up, it's those magic nights. And that's that's what this That's was. when it feels like butter. I, I'm totally with you. Yep. You can have, yes, those nights where one or the other is flowing just fine, but the other is, you know, like frustrating and oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. It's nice yeah. when it all comes together. That's great, man. I'm glad to yeah. hear it. Yeah. It was it was a lot of fun. And, and uh, this week we have a big Fourth of July one. I actually want to talk about that because it's interesting for me because it is a gig that we did not get a headline slot for. We're support on it. Oh, 
where 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 one before the headline game, and it's kind of an all day thing that culminates with with a, a fireworks show about nine at night, and we have a four thirty to six thirty slot. And then some other band has, I think, a seven to nine slot. And then not some other band, a really, really good band and sure. really nice people who are, yeah. you know, they, yeah, I, I don't want to play that down. But it's an interesting thing for me because, you know, I, uh, I I think in our town around here, we've gotten to a place of pretty good notoriety. And the band that's playing in front of us is is from uh, the San Francisco area. They're, so they're from north of here. And I'd like to think we have better name recognition just because we've been playing down here for so long. But, you know, the, and, when you get these a, slots, you're a competitive guy. I mean, you, that's, you like that's to win. Thing. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, again, it's about ego and it's about, you know, respect and about a lot of those types of things. And again, there's no malice here. But, you know, the point I wanted to talk about was it, com- competition you know, doesn't need to be rooted in malice. Right. It's OK to have it and still have goodwill. It, and well, I, th- th- I there's think- a sense of maturity that comes in that, that I, I agree with you a thousand percent. You kind of have to mature into that understanding. Yes. That, yes, that, to- you know, totally. But I- competition. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a local booker here. He's a good guy. And we've worked with him, you know, on and off through the years. I don't think he, for whatever reason, and he won't tell me um, why, you know, we don't get more work from him, A, and B, why he would have made a choice like this. Again, the band that's opening for us is not no slight on them at all. They're really, really good and really nice people and great resume. And they do a lot of great work. And so you, this is not about band, that. You mean the band you're opening for? The band, yeah, that's playing after us. Yes. Yeah, yeah okay. And so it's not about that. It's more, you know, I don't, this is a booking guy who I can't get in his head and understand. I mean, he's he's really sparsely communicative on email, like when booking season is happening, you get these kind of one word, you know, later, you know, the type of things we have, I can never think of a gig we've done for him that we haven't crushed it, but we just don't seem to have made his a list. You know, uh, we get a choice. And actually the funny thing is when he announces us, when we've played shows, he'll go one of the best bands on the West coast. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, maybe he does that for every band, yeah, but yeah, it, yeah. You know, the words come out of his mouth. And, and like I said, to my mind, I think we've crushed it, but you know, we just, we just don't seem to be a first choice for him for whatever reason. It could be that we're pretty saturated in this area. I would love to know that if that's the case. Well, have you, I have mean, you asked him? I, I have asked him. And, you know, I mean, I've asked him, but I've never been able to like be eye to eye with him. I got, I've asked him to lunch and you know, that type of thing yeah. to try and figure this out. You know, I've tried to build a relationship. This is, I mean, this is reminding me because it, it's, it's exactly the same thing of what we deal with sometimes with, you know, media buyers that are, that are out there spending either their dollars or their company's dollars on advertising or whatever. Right. It's the, it's the same thing where you say, well, yeah, you know, I, I want more of their attention. I can't sit and look and say, this is the reason we don't, you know, we, we don't resonate with this person or this brand. So sometimes we just ask flat out, like, hey, it's great working together if you do get any amount of you know business from them. Uh, but the question is always, I'd love to know what I can do to earn more of your business. Right. And and factoring in some of that humility into the process of, you know, let's put this on me for a second, because. At, there is that whole concept of sales, which the the foundation of it is you ask them to put their objections on the table. And once they do that, as long as you can take away their objections, they're stuck in a spot where they have to buy. Right. Mm. <laughs> they don't have to. But but that that's sort of the natural progression of, of, you know, human nature is give me your objections so that I can take them away. And and so, you know, asking someone. And they hey, know that the cor- the correlated Next conversations. Well, you told me this and yeah. I've done this. So yeah, and why I've not? Done this. And right. so, so a lot of times people will avoid the answer in the first place because they're used to getting the second because, part of the question. Because they're savvy and they know they don't <laughs> want that. Yeah. But but, you know, it's it. That's the question to ask is, you know, what can I do to earn more of your business? Or is there a reason, you know, those just going straight at it. And, I, you know, oftentimes you're in a nothing left to lose scenario. I mean, you don't mm. want to be a jackass about it, but if you're not getting any business from someone, then it's that conversation's easier to have. Cause it's like, well, if I don't have the conversation, it remains at $0. Right. So now like this guy's a little bit different cause he's worth more than $0 to you, but still like, sounds like it's worth finding a, a you know, an appropriate 
respectful way to ask that question. How can I earn more of your business? I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's one of my favorite I, I, points I, I, to ask. I, I'm guessing listening to you saying that I'm guessing that I haven't focused enough and, and put it on the table. I, I think I have, but I don't have anything to report back that gives me any indication right. that I have data. Right. Yeah, right so I'm right. kind of thinking about, I think yeah. mostly I'm mired in the frustration. Right. Well, it's totally <laughs> you know, easy to get like, that way. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. You know, we busted our butt every time we played, we shake hands, we say, let's do more together. And I can remember all those things. So, 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 you know, now, now we'll take it to this coming Wednesday. And so, you know, we have about a hundred minutes to burn the house down and, you know, we're, I'm definitely, there's no pacing on the show that I'm about to, to put together. It's going to be, you know, from downbeat till we're done, you know, try and do something. And, uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's not like, it's not like we're opening for, you know, a touring national act who's carefully picked a complimentary sure. undercard, right? You know, it's like, nope, we're all in this to, you know, show what we have. And I actually think it's kind of cool. Like if I was the headlining band, I would want that band before me to light it up and get the, and get the audience just frenzy. That would Absolutely. make my job easier, right? Yeah. But yeah. that's the name. Again, it's not like when you're a touring band and you pick a band that, you know, you know, is going to be complimentary to what you're doing. And, and there's a, there's a rhyme or reason to that strategy, but this is like, and you know, the booking guy even said, don't look at it as a, as an opening gig. He said, you know, it's a full day festival and, and you know, there's people there all day long. I'm, you know, to me, I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> we both know, you know, what's real here. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I'm kind of enjoying picking the songs and, you know, in my mind, working through what the show is going to be like and how to start at a 10 out of 10 and end at a, at a 20 out of 10 and, and really, you know, this will be our opportunity to do that. And, and, you know, we have some good things happening right now, Dave. I mean, you know, the various ways, the number of people coming out to our shows, number of people talking about our shows, number of inbound inquiries going on. And I, you know, this happens at the beginning of every summer, you know, we're playing mostly clubs and we've had the conversation. Some of your fans like clubs, some of them don't, but they all can go to an outdoor gig when they can bring their kids or anything like that. And so, you know, there's like a good little surge going now. We've been adding, again, another indicator is like, oddly, we're adding about 20 Facebook fans a week, which is, you know, pretty good. That's a good clip. Right? Yeah. I, it is. Like, and it's been that way for about three or four weeks. So, um, you know, there's a little surge because we're doing really well outside right now. Um, we had one um, messy gig. Um, and even that, we saved it at the end. You know, the last three or four songs just really got everybody out and that type of thing. Um, but by and large, it's, it's going really well. And I'm really encouraged going into this gig. So the a whole point of this whole conversation is I, I believe, especially in our town, we should be the, the go-to, you know, we've earned that with years, polish, you know, effort, marketing, all those types of things. And so I take this as a personal challenge and, and uh, you know, I'm not going to do it like you said, through, through confrontational measures or right. we go out and try and burn the, burn the house down. And you know, that, that is the method by which we'll try to make our point. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, and I mean, that's, you know, like in any business, that's sort of how it goes. You will encounter some people that don't see your product the same way you do. And it's your job to convince them otherwise, or, but, but there's also a point at which that is not a valuable endeavor, right? is if you're going to spend, if you pick, it's always good. I think in a, in a sales oriented business, which is what you have, especially when you have a limited market, which is what we all have, uh, where you pick some white whales, right. And you're like, I want to figure that out. Cause it gives you, you know, something to reach towards and some things to do. But if you find that you're, you've spent, you know, and you got to figure out where the, the number is, but X number of hours chasing down this white whale, and you've done all the things that you know you can do at some point you say, well, if I had taken those 20 hours and gone after these, you know, five other things, you know, three of those would have borne fruit. And maybe that's a smarter move next time, you know. So, See, you're, you're talking entirely like a non-musician right now. I know. If you're allocating hours to goals. I think you're here. Yeah. I think you've wandered out of the core musician demographic well, but, but, concept. But that's the thing is it's 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 all the same, right? You you have to think about it that way because if you don't, someone else will. And mm. going back to our discussion last week, you know, those people will beat you out for those gigs eventually. 
even if their their bands aren't as good as your band. And that's I, that's I, the frustrating. I, I agree with that. Yeah. Someone with goals, whether yeah. intentional or not, whether they're writing them down or whether they're just you know just, visualizing them, yeah, you know that they're more likely to gravitate towards achieving the goal than someone who's just waiting to luck into something. I agree with that in premise. Yes. No, actually, I agree with that in practice actually. But um, I think uh, we've had a really good um, string of ideas here. I think as we talk to the general musician public as well. I mean, remember, I don't think like you, right. I have a different wired brain. You have of a course. very uniquely wired brain, my good friend. <laughs> and you know, you're, 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 you're very task and goal oriented, which is, you know, an interesting part of your brain that you activate to solve problems. I think there, for most musicians, you know, the, like the, the, I think the most useful thing that, that I get from today's conversation reminder, not all competition has to be, aggressive, yes. malicious, confrontational. Yes. And I think actually, you know, that those kind of, that kind of approach to have a lot of conversations with a lot of people about a lot of gigs, so right? That, you know, that's, that's the, that's one thing I was going to circle back to you. You said goals. I, I even said goals. I, I actually hate goals. I, I, I subscribe to the concept that goals are for losers because when you reach your goal, the tendency is to stop. Right. I've gotten here. What's next? Well, I don't know. I didn't talk. I didn't think about what's next. So I'm someone who likes systems a whole lot more than goals. And you put together systems that you just keep doing it and it churns out results. Right. And then you never stop because the system keeps going. You tweak the system. You look at the results and all of that stuff. But but what you just described is actually a system, right? You just keep doing this thing. You, you know what you need to do. You make it happen. And then the stuff just comes right out of it. So, it's so yeah, now let's break that down. Cause I agree with that entirely. So I'm process systems, same thing. Yep. I think yeah, it's process. really good. So, yeah. and this is like, you know, you wake up on Monday morning, you're determined to get 20 press kits out, you know, yeah. uh, up, update your list of goals you're going at your, or gigs you're going after, you know, um, get an email out to your fan base. You know, that, that is a process to me. And that's, exactly. that's I think that's universal, for, essential for any kind of success, right? Do something, tweak it, get it to where it works, refine it constantly yep. and then do it again. I think that that's really good. That actually would be an interesting show. Like what are processes for, for bands, you know, what are processes for, and we talked about them without calling it that, right? We've talked yeah. about how we rehearse. Yeah. We talk about how we load in. We talk about a lot of these types of things and human nature is one of two things. You either, you either just ease into something and it becomes easy. And so you don't touch it again and you yeah. never question whether it's as good as it can be, or, you know, you're constantly of the kind of mind that wants to iterate and iterate, iterate. And you know, that this is what you hear about songwriters all the time, right? You know, they constantly iterate, 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 iterate. That's a process. Yep. It totally is. Yeah. Eventually you have to ship and that's the issue with songwriting, <laughs> right? I mean, well, I mean, you got to You got to get it to a point where you're comfortable saying, here's my song. Right. If well, if it's something you're going to release as, uh, you know, a single, right, or, or on an album or whatever. But if you're only playing that song live, well, then that gives you the freedom to constantly iterate, right? And well, that's actually a process in itself. So, you know, like with Stanford, right? Uh, you know, they're they're they start with ship, right? Their, their emphasis is ship and right. figure out everything after that, right? Yep. So that's Stanford Business School, yep. and um, so. Uh, that's an interesting concept. Like a lot of people book the gig first yes. and then figure out who's going to play it or, you know, get the songs ready. You know, that that's doing that somewhat puts the, all the pressure in place. I don't know that that's sustainable if you're not really on it. Right. That, you know, if, if you're the guy who just swings for the fences without thinking of everything that kind of comes into <laughs> being successful. Right. That, that creates challenge and stress for everybody involved. It totally does. But it can but it can be a a path to consistent success if the right people are involved. It, it But it it's not the only path to consistent success, because like you said, it can be very stressful. You have to have the right minds and the people that are that are that thrive in that environment, not just people that can deal with it, but people that that truly thrive in that environment. That's right. right. Yep. Interesting. It's crazy. Hey, Simon and I are doing a cool one. Simon and I are going to do, Simon's the, uh, my guitar playing partner in the House Rockers, and we've done a couple of acoustic gigs, which are really fun. 
they're very, um, because we're both guitar players, you know, they, we tend to stretch guitar parts out and, you know, toss solos back and forth. And it's just different than the other things that I'm doing, which is really kind of fun. But we uh, just took a gig and it's going to be circling back to other conversations we've had. It's a 90s theme night. So we got to learn a bunch of 90s music. So we started putting together song lists for it, and duo acoustic. So it'll be, you know, acoustic Nirvana and acoustic. Pearl Jam and Soundgarden and that type of stuff. But it's really kind of fun to kind of dive into that music that I've been actually, it's not that I've been critical of the music. I mostly say, I think what, what I've said is, is that the nineties, for whatever reason, music wasn't as much of a cultural yeah. emphasis worked its way into the mainstream cultural mind with all, all the other things and all the other types of music that are going on and all, you know, the changing landscape of the world. It's different than what music did for people in the sixties and seventies. And I don't know how much, I don't know how much nineties will be played 10, 20, 30 years from now by cover bands. Um, assuming there'll be cover bands, right. but um, yeah. I think that's a but, safe assumption, but yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's a safe assumption. The, the, the but, cover um, band thing. I actually, I think nineties music, some of it, will will be played for a very long time but, but like with anything and you made this point and, yeah. and I, what i said is i've come back around and there's a lot of really amazing things to be found uh in this music i mean really re remarkable stuff and uh so i'm looking forward to diving back into it so we've divided up the set lists we're gonna get together and actually rehearse once and you know kind of see what each other has to bring and then we're gonna do three hours of 90s music wow so. that's a lot of 90s music man huh. it is huh. <laughs> Huh. But, so, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, you've got, you know, in, in addition to the, the ones you mentioned and, of course, Foo Fighters and things like that, you can arguably put some REM stuff in the 90s, right? Because uh, even, even though the REM happened in the 80s, they really weren't part of the 80s thing, right? They were more like the 90s, I, I think, uh, in that sense. But you've also got your Dave Matthews Band stuff, right? So much of that uh, fits yeah. into the 90s. But I don't know. Does it? truly fit into the nineties vibe or are you just like saying, okay, here's the year it was released. So well, yeah, here's it's the interesting. Yeah. They, they, they want, they want an emphasis on the grunge stuff, but okay, um, there you I, go. Yeah. Let, let me just, let me just share a couple of these songs for you. Sure. Okay? Yeah. So Radiohead will do uh, karma police and high and dry. Um, fake plastic trees. Be, be careful of high and be careful of all that radio we do that. stuff. Oh, it, it's great. Well, we, we do, it, we're do, we've been it, doing it. It's great. It can be um, crowd killers, right? It, it can be dance floor killers. But I guess if you're just doing acoustic stuff, that's different. Yeah. 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 We've been doing high and dry. Simon sings the heck out of it. It's really, you know, it's three chords over and over yeah. and over again. Right. And um, and it's just it is. It's very moody music. And you're right. If it was a full band, it could probably bring, the, <laughs> you know, creep is not the not the most, uh, you know, pleasant message to share with people no but creep is probably That's the, the best radiohead song to play if you are trying to keep people out of their seats i i still don't know that it's going to be successful but of all the radiohead tunes that i've played live that might be the only one that that keeps people up and out there you go yep so yeah all right um uh, interstate love song stone temple pilots nice yep uh jeremy and even flow from pearl jam Elderly woman, but from Pearl Jam. Yeah, I think 1979 is Smashing Pumpkins, right? Uh, sure. I, you know, no, I, right. I've played a lot of Smashing Pumpkins. I don't, I don't have a like a good working knowledge of their catalog, though. So, got it. So then, to that, yep, we're going to throw in a couple of Dave Matthews tunes. I, I am a big Counting Crows fan, so we'll throw in a lot of Counting Crows. Um, we we'll do the Nirvana hits, um, Black Hole Sun. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a big Matchbox 20 fan too. I mean, I just like that kind of power pop stuff. And Great. so, yeah. Yeah. And Simon's gonna do some Weezer stuff. And then what about Bare Naked Oasis Ladies? Tunes. I didn't think about that. God, that's, that's a good a one. Great. They're a great band. And that is the nineties. It's yeah. totally the nineties. Yeah, yeah. We, so we do a lot of nineties stuff acoustic in, in monkey fist. So a lot of the songs you're mentioning are sort of staples in the monkey fist catalog. And just the way Johnny D sings the bare naked lady stuff works yep. perfectly. Yep. Yep. Um, dude, I, I've always wanted to do, if I had a million dollars, I just, that song is just nice to me. <laughs> that Johnny and I do that every single gig we play. And it together. goes over every gig, right? Every time. Yeah, man. It's a sing-along. It's a sing-along. People love it. We usually do it as a, either a set ender or a set opener. Um, it's a, it's great as a first set ender, 
because it, it puts people in the right mood. It, it, it almost guaranteed to engage the entire room, especially in an acoustic setting where, you know, it's a little more intimate and that sort of thing. And people get engaged and they don't leave. Like it, it is one of those songs that can carry you through a set break. And then people are there. Oh, God, that was great. Oh yeah. Let's stick around. Let's get another beer, whatever, you know, and then, and then you're good for the second set. So, yeah. Well, you know, you know, I kind of want to bring something up here. We got a couple of really cool compliments on our shows, the house rocker shows lately about the positive energy. And we've had some interesting conversations through song choices about, you know, happy, songs are probably the best thing for us to do in the world right now. Like we're not, we're not, we're not trying to make people think we're not trying to people, you know, we're trying to make people smile for two hours and that that's what our job is. Right. And so it's interesting. I, I, I really enjoy that compliment that people say we're that what an experience of seeing our band and kind of like whatever I do musically, you know, it, it is a positive uplifting experience. That's pretty cool. I mean, again, we all like dark music. Sometimes. We all have our moments where we need to yeah. go. Sometimes, right? Yeah. We, we have times we need to go there. It's an interesting thing as a cover artist to go there, right? Yep. Because a large part of the angst that you extract from the person who wrote the song you know, is a very authentic one-to-one -one experience, right? A lot of what you get covering angst is actually difficult. It, it, you know, if you're really going to emote that song um, and inhabit the song, yeah, it, it's actually, that's a thing, you know, and it's hard to place in a set is another thing, you know, yes, right? Yes. Right. But if you go see Radiohead, it's going to be a ride of a certain mood, very authentic because you're hearing from the person who, originated the thought yeah who wrote it um and and so i'm agreeing with you that that um angst is hard to cop angst is hard to communicate even especially if as a one-off in the middle of a set it, right and as a one-off in the middle of the set you almost have to like amanda does a pretty good job amanda dane when i when i play acoustic gigs with her she does a pretty good job of incorporating those songs that are angsty but almost by just changing them enough so that they're more melancholy than angsty. Right. So it's still not and is that changing them enough, a reflection of who she is yes. and the way that she is. And, and that, so again, the foundational thing that I always think about when we have these conversations is what communicates most is truth. Right. And so, you know, if there isn't a, a sense of authenticity in taking a song because you love a song, but it's not quite you recognizing that, and finding the you in it is probably the most noble pursuit for a, for a cover artist to go after. I totally agree. Yes, you have to deliver it. Right. At some level, you have to be respectful of w what the song was written to be. That doesn't mean you need to play it note for note. Right. It's just respectful. I like the song. That's good. Here's my way of doing it that, like you say, is true. It's very representative of who I am. And as I always say in fling, you know, we have to let songs become flingified and it's, you know, the five of us playing this song that one or more of us really like, and that's great, but it has to, we have to let it shine through us. We can't try and do it like the, uh, you know, like the, with the, with the same emotion that the original artist wrote it because it's not us. We have yeah. to let us play this song because we're not like no one looking at us thinks that we are some other band. If someone's looking at you playing a song, they know exactly who you are. You're the house rockers. You're playing You're your band, whatever that is. So why not embrace that and just let it be you? And here's who yeah. we are. And we're playing this song that we like. And yeah, good to go. And and yes, that works well. And that's exactly what happens with with Amanda with these songs. She just she's a happy person. She's a positive person. Um, that's, I mean, that's who she is, but that's also her on stage persona. I mean, like you said, we all have our dark moments and this, that, and the other thing, but you know, on stage, she's, she's that happy portion of herself. And, and so these sad songs really, I mean, they turn out to be super powerful because it, she's not at all trying to deliver angst. She's just singing the crap out of these things that have, you know, baked in emotion and she's just letting that shine through her. And that's, that's the yeah. way to do it.
Yep. I got another song for you, man. Staring at the sun from uh, from U2. Ever since I saw them live and the and they did it acoustic with just the two of the Edge and Bono singing it, it it like I've realized how powerful that song is. And it's I'm gonna check it out. I don't yeah, know. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Cool. I'm adding it to the list. Yeah, cool. Hey, speaking of uh original music, the US Senate this week passed the Music Modernation Modernization Act, which essentially include it includes lots of things, but um, it really sort of uh, brings all of the rights payments in line with the, the streaming fo- focused world that we live in today. And it really is a good thing. It's like a total bipartisan thing. And I, I haven't seen anybody complaining about it, although I'm sure there's some stuff that's wrong with it because no legislation is perfect. But it from what I can see, it really um really takes care of uh, songwriters and artists in today's world, including people that wrote songs, you know, prior to 1972 that have just been getting screwed and screwed and screwed by, um, by all these, you know, streaming rights and all that stuff. Uh, so I just wanted to so mention are the that. the streaming companies screaming? No, that's the thing is the streaming companies are saying, hey, this is good. The lobbyists for the streaming companies are saying it's good. The lobbyists for the RIAA or the people at the RIAA are saying it's good. The people at ASCAP and BMI are saying it's good. That's why I'm saying like it's it's surprisingly being met with, and I think, you know, all of these people were sort of involved in crafting this thing. So yeah, no, I think it's a good thing because we, and my guess is that the streaming companies are smart enough to realize if we don't take care of this, um, we can't keep doing what we're doing because artists need to get paid. Otherwise we don't have music to stream. Uh, mm. So yeah, maybe, I don't know. That's, That's my forward. interpretation of That's it. Progressive. <laughs> exactly. Well, look, you know, and now I'm, I'm totally putting on, you know, my own lens onto this, but for, for, you know, streaming companies, relatively speaking, that's a new business model, right? And mm-hmm. anybody who's running a streaming, streaming company is aware of how the RIAA tried to hold on to the old business model that they had and how that really almost like killed everything there. Cause they, you know, they were like, well, no, just keep selling albums. That's okay. Like, we'll just no problem. We, we can ignore what's going on in the world. It's totally fine. Head in the sand. We've got this and it really doesn't work. Right. Um, and, and, and that's been proven and we're going to see it proven again with the, the movie industry too. And so I think the streaming companies have to be aware of that because they are the thing that ruined that. So for them to repeat the same mistake of, well, let's put our heads in the sand and ignore the fact that we're not really paying artists uh, enough to support themselves and do the thing that we need in order for our business to work. I, I, I would hope that they would be open minded enough to, to say that's not sustainable for this you know new business model that we have. So that's my interpretation of this. I could be totally wrong and I probably am. But uh, mm. but I, I like that. So I'm just going to stick with that until I until proven otherwise. So if you want to prove us wrong, mm. feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Love to hear about it. But I just wanted to mention that. I thought it was a really good thing. Cool. Yeah. Hey, um, I just wanted to share that um, the boss in my house, my wife, feels compelled to present the wife's perspective mm. of the Gig Gab universe. How do you feel about that? I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. So are we going to convince uh, Terry and Lisa to come on the show sometime and share their perspectives, you think? We have to make it happen this month. I, I think next couple of weeks are a little weird, but I think towards the end of the month, I think we absolutely have to do that. I mean, we'll put on, you know, the flak jackets and, you know, oh, yeah. flame retardant suits, but uh, I think it's an important thing to do. Yeah. We'll just start the show and, and end the show and, and we'll let them we'll let them handle the uh, the content in the middle. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. yeah. That's good. That's good. I like it. Yes. Yes. If you All have right, any man. questions for the, the wife's perspective, you know, again, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. So uh, what else do we have? So I, I had a weird thing this week with Tommy, right? Because I, as I mentioned, you know, I, I'm splitting uh, the drum chair duties with George Regan, another drummer uh, who's great drummer. And it's actually been really cool 
to go through. We basically both been at every rehearsal where that was possible. There were a couple George couldn't make, but otherwise we were both there all the time. I was certainly there for every one of his rehearsals and he was there for most of mine. And yes, it's a little unnerving playing a show, especially sort of learning a show and knowing a lot of times, you know, you can skip a part or not, not skip a part, but, you know, simplify a part or something just to get through it. Um, and it's fine. Generally speaking, no one even knows, let alone says anything about it. You just, as long as you're playing what needs to be, you know, there for the for the moment. But playing and knowing that there's not only just someone, but another drummer who's also learning the show, reading along in the exact same book that, that I'm reading from knowing full and well when I cheat and when I don't, or when I you know, flub <laughs> something or what I don't. Yo, oh, yeah. And, and of course, you know, he, go, when he was playing, it, it, he goes through the same thing, you know, because we both know the show. Um, so that part's actually been great because it, you know, being able to, to learn a show and having someone else that's playing literally the same parts to, you know, bounce ideas off of and Oh, Hey, you know, I realized one thing and it's like, Oh, that's a great idea. Thanks. Or, you know, those kinds of things. It's really made the rehearsal process way better. Um, and so, you know, we went through this process and there were even some extra rehearsals called. Uh, so I wound up rehearsing all the way up through the show. Well, I'll say it opened Thursday night. Technically it opened Friday. Thursday night was a preview, but Thursday was the first time it was in front of an audience. So that's opening to me. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, so I played, they, they called the special rehearsal because we had this major problem with guitar players. It was like spinal tap and drummers was Tommy and guitar players. We just couldn't <laughs> keep them. We had guys that like we signed up and then they didn't have the time. And then we had a guy quit and like all this other crazy stuff. And we're constantly moving things around. So we brought in a guitar player that had played it with one of these guys, uh, with one of the producers, one of the directors 12 years ago. And, but he needed an extra rehearsal because he doesn't actually read music. He had taken the, I think he reads better than he lets on, but he had taken the whole thing and essentially charted out the theater show as though it were a rock show with, with just with chord charts and written descriptions of, you know, play this vamp until you, the guy says the line about the eggs and then change to this. And so he needed an extra rehearsal, which we did on Thursday afternoon. Uh, so there it was, you know, I, which I played because George, the other drummer, couldn't make that one at the last minute. So I'm there, you know, we finish 5.15, maybe at 5.30, I'm packing stuff up and I'm walking out the door because George played every show this weekend, the way we've split it. I'm basically doing the end of the run. He's doing the beginning of the run, but we were both there for rehearsals. And it was this really strange feeling walking out of the theater at 5.30 when curtain is at 7.30 and I'm like winding down for the day, kind of packing up my stuff and like, okay, take it easy, everybody have a good show, you know, and they're all in like chicken with their heads cut off mode, trying to get this thing ready to actually open in, you know, T minus two hours. And uh, so it was really weird not being there for the opening and not being there at all this weekend, you know, and of course I hear from friends that went to see it this weekend. They're like, oh, the show's awesome. It's like, yeah, that's. That's just weird. You know, I mean, I'm glad it's like it's not a negative thing. It's just a really weird thing to pour all this energy and emotion and 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 effort into this thing. And and then I'm not involved in the actual performance of it for a little while. You know, I'm actually playing Thursday night this week and then uh, not again until after I come back. And then and then I'll be playing like five shows a weekend for a couple of weekends. So I'll, I'll, I'll get. Yeah. Oh, it's worse than that, Paul. So, (laughs) so. But there's more. Yes, there's more. So Tommy runs, it's a main stage production at Seacoast Rep. It runs uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights and Saturday and Sunday matinees. So there's five shows a weekend. When I come back, we are, we are flying back on Thursday night. So I can't do the Thursday night show. George is doing that. Um, I was going to audit the Friday show cause I've been away for two weeks, but after all these rehearsals, I realized I, I don't, I'm like, I'm not going to need the audit. I told George, take the night off. I'm going to be there anyway. I'll play the show. And the reason I'm going to be there anyway. Uh, so I'll have four Tommy performances the, the weekend I come back, but the reason I was going to be there on Friday anyway, in addition to auditing the show and just getting my head back into it and now playing the show instead, uh, is that on the, the last two weekends of this Friday and Saturday night at midnight, we're also doing 
Rocky Horror, which listeners uh, might remember I did back in the winter there. So I won't have any rehearsals with that, but I will have uh, six performances in uh, in that weekend and then seven the following weekend. So it'll be a lot of playing. Mm. Um, yeah, that that Saturday, you know, Friday at 8 p.m., Saturday, or Friday at 8 p.m., Friday at midnight, you know, then Saturday, 2 p.m., Saturday, 8 p.m., Saturday, midnight, Sunday, 2 p.m. The, the, my chops will be great. I'll tell you, my, tell you what. My chops were great after a week of rehearsing Tommy. Um, you know, with all those six tuplet fills that I've got to play with the keep moon. What's the hardest song to play? <sighs> um, well, technically like, like in terms of, of just the number of notes that I have to play, I think the Can under keep on. Yeah. The underture, which is the opening song of the second act is very technically challenging. Um, it, it is very much in my wheelhouse though. Like I, you know, I didn't grow up playing a lot of who music, but I did grow up playing a lot of Rush music. And of course, Rush and especially, you know, their drummer, Neil Peart, was very much influenced by The Who and Keith Moon. So a lot of those things are just in my in my bones. Um, I, I Obviously, I had to learn them the right way to to be able to play these parts. But uh, so they're they're technically challenging, but in a fun way. The songs that are the hardest, though, are the two songs that where I believe Keith Moon's drum part was the best part. And that's Tommy, can you hear me? And Tommy's holiday camp where Keith Moon played nothing. Uh, They have added drum parts to those songs. And Tommy, can you hear me? Is this weird, like one drop reggae thing, but it's swung in a very white way. It's just, it's so wrong. Um, And it never feels right. And I was talking to George, the other drummer about it. I'm like, yeah, just like, this, this it feels like a square peg in a round hole. He's like, I feel exactly the same way. He's like, I don't get it. I'm like, well, go listen to the original version and you'll understand. He's like, there's no drum part. I'm like, see what I'm saying? Should just be acoustic <laughs> guitar and vocals and it sounds great. So those are the hardest ones because the feel, there is no correct feel that that has been developed for them. Um, right. So, and, and right, the, so you go on vacation, you, you gather your, all your energy and then you come back and you lay it all out. I lay it all out again. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But it should be interesting. So, um, yeah, but it, it's fun. It's really weird. The Broadway score is much heavier than the Who's score. Uh, like, you know, if you go listen to Tommy, just the Who's album, Tommy, and then go listen to the Broadway album, Tommy, it's like twice as heavy. They've really like, you know, turned it into this overly energetic rock thing. It's fun to play. But as I've often said, you know, the who is really an acoustic band, right? Uh, you know, it's Pete Townsend on, on often acoustic guitar, or even just, you know, non-distorted electric sort of holding the rhythm down. And then you've got these guys sort of playing around him. Whereas the, the musical becomes much more of a driving rock sort of thing. Right. Um, a lot less campy than, than Tommy. So, but that, I mean, it's fine. I, I'm not a who, I'm not a who purist. So th- these things, I don't know if this bothers who pur- purist, but I'm not one of them. So it, it, it doesn't bother me at all. In fact, it's, it's more. Well, Tommy's been done, you know, by many, not Keith Moon style drummers you know, in, in that format for a long time. And so, That's correct. Yeah. you know, it's been out there in, in non pure ways and in, in many for a long time, for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And I, I again, I don't know how who purists perceive this Broadway thing. I mean, Townsend was very much involved in in putting this on the Broadway stage. So I don't I don't know if it's even seen as a negative thing by anyone. I, it's I, I actually, like it. It's fine. Yeah. The Who has performed it without Keith Moon and, you know, with different yeah. approaches to it, right? Yeah, I saw did him Kenny with Jones uh, play it. He, I'm sure he did. I, I never saw him with Kenny Jones, but I did see them. I think it was 89. I saw him with Simon Phillips and they they performed most of Tommy uh, live, you know, just in concert, not 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 with actors or anything. But uh, all right, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a really interesting question to close okay. with today. All right. You get to choose three guys to audition for Keith Moon's spot, knowing everything, you know, since he passed who are the three drummers that you think would have been the coolest to replace Keith Moon? Well, anybody, any genre, anything, any age, anything. So, yep. um, 
I, I, I would definitely, you know, add Neil Peart to the list. He's certainly one of the most accomplished Keith Moon inspired drummers that exists. Right. So, but, but it would change things. Right. And, and mm-hmm. I think you sort of have to ex- accept that going into this, no one plays like Mooney played. Um, it, it, you can, you can play the fills, you can play the things, but he thought about the beat in a very upside down way. And, and I don't know if he thought about it or he just, or he just felt it. Right. I I, think, he just emoted it. Yeah. I, I, like, the latter is certainly the general consensus. The more I learn about Keith Moon, the more I learn that he was a lot more intentional than we all tend to give him credit for. But but yes, regardless, the outcome is that he he had a very different way of of interpreting the beat and interpreting the groove. And and because of the way the who was organized, he was free to to do that. Right. If you put him in the stones, he couldn't have played that way for the stones to to be who the stones were either. Right. Like he would have had to have been a, a whole lot more driven and, and focused on his parts. Um, although he was very focused, but, but just in terms of driving the groove, he didn't drive the groove in the who, right. Townsend drove mm-hmm. the groove. So, right. um, so Peart and, and he would change the band uh, dramatically. I'm trying to think uh, I have, I have my last one in mind for sure. Um, I don't know who I would have in the middle uh, you know, Simon Phillips did a great job with it. Um, he was a little more straight. I mean, he's a prog rock drummer. Uh, so, you know, you sort of have to you sort of have to deal with with that. I'm trying to think of somebody that's like bombastic and and crazy. Um, and I think if you. what's that? I've got one for you. OK. Go Ginger Baker. Yeah, I like that idea. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. That's what I was trying to go for. I, Ginger's name hadn't come to mind, but yes, that sort of, I'm just going to blast through this whole thing and do this. Yeah, Ginger Baker would be a perfect number two for me. All right. And, and then number the th- three? Number three is Zach Starkey, uh, well, who who has played with The Who, right? Um, and is truly the perfect uh, Keith Moon disciple, although that's probably the wrong word to use. To, to put in the drum chair, because even though his dad was Ringo, he learned a whole lot more about the drums from Keith than he ever did from from his dad. And and he worked out perfectly. I saw him with the who I did. It wasn't that long ago within the last five years. And he was just perfect with that band. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to blow your mind here. What about Grohl? Um, so Grohl is very much like of the meat and potatoes drumming style. Like, I mean, he's very uh, talented. He's got a lot of technique. Uh, I think Taylor Hawkins has even more technique than, than Dave Grohl, but, but those guys are just like power drummers. They want to drive the band Grohl very much. So, right. So I, it would, it would, he would be great with them. Uh, and I think it would actually be a lot of fun but he would capture the energy for sure. Yes. He would capture the, the energy. Manicness. Yep. But he would be, he would be holding down the groove. Even if you told him he didn't have to. Mm. So, Interesting. um, unique band for sure. D- definitely. And, and having gotten into this again, you know, Tom, like I've said it a couple of times. Tommy has, has reared its head in odd ways uh, in, in, and in very influential ways throughout my life especially given that I'm, I don't seek it out. I, I like it, but it's not the, like I said, the who isn't one of my top, you know, five bands or something, I, but I very much like them and, and, and all of that. But um, yeah, Tommy has always been like, there's, you know, throughout my life, it seems like every 10 years, something comes up where it's like, Hey, Tommy, here you go. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, yeah. Very, but digging in this time, you know, I did, I did something I, I never ever should have done. Um, but I felt okay. And I'll find out Thursday if it was a mistake. I, you know, I listened to the Broadway cast recording. I learned, I relearned the thing. As I said, I, you know, I played it almost exactly 20 years ago and really had learned it very, very well, almost memorized by then. And all those memories came back. So it was like, oh yeah, I remember this. Okay, great. No problem. Um, after I got through with all the rehearsals the next day at my desk, uh, when I have like, you know, busy work or desk work to do, I always have music going. And I played the Who's version. 
of Tommy. I should never like that goes against <laughs> every, I should wait till the runs over all of that. But listening to it, it was like, Oh yeah, this is like really mellow in most ways. And, and, you know, sort of campy and it's very much sounds like an album that was written and released in the 1960s. And as it turns out, of course it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, of course. Right. So yeah, yeah, but I, I think right, I'll well, be good okay. Good luck Thursday on your night. run, man. I, you'll crush it. And, I'm sure and, I will. Uh, I'm looking forward we'll to get it. A, we'll I, get a good report about about uh, how intense it was. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be crazy. Yeah, but it'll be fun, which is good. Good. So sweet. Go get them. We got anything else to uh, to chat about here? Is that... No. Safe travels on your vacation. Have a nice Fourth of July. Thanks, man. You too. And uh, we'll uh, we'll catch you again shortly, here, folks. We'll see you next time feedback cool. at giggabpodcast.com we would love to hear from you hey Dave hey Paul AVP AVP